Welcome to the fourth in our series of special episodes of First and Future Connecting in Crisis. Each week, North Carolina State's Institute for Emerging Issues is bringing together North Carolina leaders around issues related to the coronavirus to talk about what they're doing, how they're doing it, and why it matters. I'm Leslie Boney, Director of the Institute for Emerging Issues, and since 1986, the Institute for Emerging Issues has been bringing North Carolinians together to learn about and move forward critical issues that are emerging across our state. Today, we're facing one of the biggest emerging issues for at least a generation, and this program is a response to that. First, just an acknowledgement that this is a profoundly sad time for our state. More than 3,300 people in North Carolina have been diagnosed with the coronavirus. The latest projections show us heading to a number maybe as high as 250,000. Uh, we're at close to 500,000 people who have filed for unemployment with more people losing jobs. 53 people have died. Uh, those that have not lost their jobs and are not sick are worried. 70% of people polled say they're very worried about what's going on. Today, we want to focus on the most vulnerable of us, those who may not be getting the information about the coronavirus or may not be getting it in a form that they can understand. We want to talk about why that matters to them, why that matters to all of us, and how we might do a better job of reaching the hard to reach people. We thank you for joining us for this show. For those of us, for those of you who are participating on Thursday morning at 9 a.m., we look forward to your questions for the guests. We ask you to submit them via chat. For those of you who are listening to a taped version of the show, please check out the show notes on our website, emergingissues.org, and you can find all the slides that we show today. Just a quick review of where we've been over the past few weeks. We started out on March 19th with an overview of the big broadband issues that were coming down the road, some of the education challenges that we had, and how faith institutions were reacting to what was going on. The next week, we looked at the online learning dilemma and the particular challenges that we had getting 2.6 million students online. Last week, we talked about the impact on small businesses and the people who work for them. This week, who's not getting the message? And next week, just a quick preview, we'll be talking about food and hunger in North Carolina and why that matters. This week, the question is, who's not getting the message and why does it matter? Maybe an initial question to address is, what's the cost if we miss people with critical information during this crisis? And there are a couple of answers, a couple of different ways of looking at that. The first and less important, but nevertheless important, is that it costs us money. Uh, here's one way. We're in the middle of a census, and the initial part of that census was conducted online. Before the coronavirus hit, North Carolina was behind where we were in 2010, and we're still below the national average in our response rate. This matters for some obvious reasons. Federal allocations and congressional seats are based on how many people you have. Each person that North Carolina miss, misses means that we will miss out on a little more than $16,000 in federal appropriations over the next decade. So far, the highest response rates are in the metro areas, particularly Wake and Mecklenburg counties. The lowest are among a group of counties in western North Carolina, but generally the rural places are the folks that are uh, not responding to the census right now. In time of pandemic, there's a different set of reasons. Uh, the worse our communication, the longer the pandemic continues, and the longer people stay out of work, and the greater health risk to everyone. And that's really what's so important about this. When it comes to communication of critical health information, effective outreach can literally mean the difference between life and death, between containment and a spike. So the stakes are high, and finding out how to reach every person in the state is a critical emerging issue. Our guests today to talk about that are Juvencia Roca Peralta, the executive director of Amexcan, a nonprofit based in Eastern North Carolina that serves the needs of Mexicans in North Carolina. Gene Tedro, the president and CEO of the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits, and Doug Erland, 
Director of the North Carolina Institute for Public Health at UNC Chapel Hill. Thanks to you all for joining us. Let me start off with a question for all of you. Who do we typically miss when we're trying to get information out during times of crisis? All of you have seen hurricanes and previous health crises. Who do we typically miss? And how many people do we typically miss? But one of, uh, uh, Leslie, thank you for, uh, for this uh, opportunity to talk to uh, the audience about uh, this particular um, issue that we're facing today. In, in terms of the history, we have seen, especially in rural Eastern North Carolina, one of the population that we miss is the minority population. And when we talk about the minority population, in particular, a population that our organization has worked for the past 20 years is within the Latino community. The particular, this particular community has different challenges in terms of getting the information. Number one, uh, information that's in their own language. Number two, this day and time, every, everything is going <clears throat> on social media and those type of platforms that a lot of people doesn't have access because of the situations where they live or because they're not very familiar with these type of new tools that we use in our social media. So their population is really um, uh, isolated from specific information that needs to go out there. Number one is because every, all the information is in English. And number two, um, it's, it's a few organizations that really uh, reach out or address the needs of this population in Eastern North Carolina. One of the things that I think uh, we had to kind of do it, and this is one of the things that we'll be doing in our organization, is linking with other non-Latino organizations that they doing some good work in terms about reaching our populations and kind of take that information and distribute it to our communities. But we had to be very sensitive in how we distribute that information because uh, we had to kind of translate that information into their own language, into the level that they understand the, the particular issue, especially right now with COVID-19. Okay. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Doug, you've been through a lot of public health communication over the years. Who do we typically miss? Who do we not get to? Who, who doesn't get the message about things that you're trying to communicate in your experience? Certainly. Thank you. And uh, to, to piggyback to what uh, Yuvincia said, minority populations, certainly those who are non-English speaking, uh, certainly folks who are in the socioeconomically disadvantaged areas, whether they're people that live in an urban area that may not have access to the internet even, or rural populations. Uh, another that we see across North Carolina, unfortunately, is a, a, a growing homeless population. And so historically, when we've dealt with outbreaks, for example, again, nothing to the magnitude of COVID-19. However, similar themes in terms of getting to the populations, if they don't have access to the internet or social media because we're in this, this world of staying at home and, and social distancing, then you work with your local community networks, nonprofits, both, both large and small that work with those designated populations, but also work with you in local public health when you're putting together your community health assessment or trying to deal with and, and address very important health issues. It's having those well-established relationships that the, that the people that live in those communities know their community and how you then can connect with those representatives in those networks to help get these messages across. Uh, in this case, of course, as it relates to public health and COVID-19 uh, and having good, accurate information and not misinformation because there's so much information. We're in information overload. We wanna make sure our messages are clear and concise and that when we provide those to those networks, they can help spread that message for us. Dean, who are some populations maybe that we haven't talked about yet that, that could be missed in this particular instance? Well, I think um, the homeless population, we should continue to talk about the homeless population because it's not a homogenous or a uh, group of people. There are homeless who are living in um, camps. There are homeless living in under bridges. There are homeless living in shelters. And all of those situations create real risk for social distancing and physical distancing. Um, and then we have um, situations where folks are, are housed, but they're very much at risk of becoming homeless because those are the ones uh, that are living in affordable rental situations where they um, are not 
uh, probably are now not working. And so they're really at risk of becoming homeless because they're not going to be able to pay their rent. If they're in private housing, the, the landlords may or may not evict them regardless of what the rules are. If they're in an affordable housing uh, situation provided by nonprofits, uh, the nonprofits are not going to evict them. In fact, they're going to continue to provide deep services in order to keep them housed and accessible to services. So um, I, I would say, and then there are the community-based organizations in rural areas as well that um, really depend on uh, community relationships in order to find uh, support and help. Right, we're gonna come back to all of you in turn, but we have some questions already from uh, folks who are watching. Uh, Juvencio, about the undocumented population, what are the special challenges in reaching those who are undocumented at this time? You know, one of the things that, that we hear is based, the biggest question that comes from the undocumented community is that I'm gonna get rapport or I'm gonna get um, in a situation where I'm putting in risk my life and the life of my children, so my family, and I'm gonna be the poor. So we have to be very conscious in terms about how we're reaching out to the population. And one of the challenges are is to get the information that comes from proper channels that they're not in, they, they cannot be in fear, that the weak, they need to trust whoever's approach the population. But had, we have to do it very consistent and stay online to what our state is saying, our local leaders are saying, uh, so we can kind of get the fear out of those communities. For example, we had last week, we had a lot of fear about this announcement from the state, from the government saying, stay home. Okay, I'm gonna stay home. But if I had to go to work, or if I had to go to the grocery store and I'm driving on the road, and I don't have driver license because we have to recognize half of the population in the state of North Carolina undocumented. So we had to kind of reach out to our local leaders, our law enforcement and say, look, this is questions I'm coming up. What are the state is telling us? The state is sending a message out, please don't be fear. This is, we're trying to protect the life of the North Carolinas and everybody, regardless of the status. So that's an example of how, how it's difficult sometimes. And we had to kind of, as Doug would say, we had to work very close with our local elected officials and agencies. They do this work and not, not put fear on our communities or kind of clear the fear out of those communities. You sent last night some tips about um, how to establish that kind of trust and build long-term relationships so that when information comes out, people can be confident that, that they're getting the right information. Let's, let's show that right now. There are just a couple of tips that you sent out that I thought were, were interesting and helpful as we uh, try to look at this. Can yeah, you speak you know, to these uh, a little bit? Uh, yes. Um, as, as we've been working, and, and this is something that, you know, we have learned in the process of almost 20 years of work in the communities, is we had to be very uh, effective at how we build these relations with this particular community. Let's remember the, this migration population is for some generations. You know, migration in the state of North Carolina began in the early 70s, but working mostly in agriculture. So most of the people are very isolated from from the entire population. So we had to kind of work together and very, very effective around other partners and other communities. We had to understand that this population is very diverse. Yes, almost 80% of the population are from Mexico, but we do have some other immigrant communities coming from other Latin American countries. So we do have to understand that each community brings different fabric into the state in terms of the culture, in terms of the why do they do things in their own countries? We also, to, to kind of be effective and successful, we had to kind of build knowledge and collaboration with local partners and help our local partners because we found that 
a lot of non Latin Latino organizations are very willing to work and help the community, but a lot of times they don't know and they don't have the tools. So we try to kind of have to be very engaged with those those communities, those organizations, and to help them understand how this community floats within within our society. You mentioned just a minute ago, uh, just to clarify. To also... uh, you mentioned just a second ago half the population that you meant that half the population of um, the Latin X community in North Carolina is undocumented. Is that right? That's what our, 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 our statistics so shows. That this is what is you know is telling us that half half of the population are undocumented in the state of North Carolina. Let's take a look at your other uh, other recommendations for change. And this is these are maybe tips that would be useful to people that are working with the Latinx population um, as they think about how to engage and ensure that uh, critical information gets out. Can you speak to this a little bit? Yes. Um, how we always take a best practice in terms of how, to, how we can work together to to address those needs of the population. And we had to kind of have a mutual benefits with our communities. And community has really has to be very committed to the, what they're doing, but also has to be a, a mutual understand between. One of the things that I always tell people, now because my name is Juvencio Rocha Peralta, I'm qualified to do the job and working with la Latino communities or, or address the needs of Latino communities. You know, people has to be qualified. We have to look at the portfolio, what they, what, what they look like, what is the history of those individuals. Not just only because they speak Spanish, they, they can be the qualified people to get into the field and working for communities. The other thing, you know, that uh, typical we found that when you do outreach to communities, I mean, outreach, it can translate in different forms. Some people translate outreach behind the desk. You can be behind the desk and do outreach, but really with new population, new communities, you have to get out there in the community. You had to be engaged with the community. You had to be engaged with those organizations and you had to be very direct and intentional when you do outreach. We had to be very extreme sensitive about the needs of this population. Each community within the immigrant community brings different respect, but also different needs. And we had to be very sensitive about that. And one of the things is that I, I can always say that when you want to do something, find a good partner that you have a common goal to address the needs of the population. If it's public health, if it's leadership, if it's education, find a partner that really believes what you're doing and build that on, on that. I wanted to show just a, a list of some of the other organizations that are, that are intentionally serving the Latinx community in North Carolina. And these are some in different parts of the state that have been recommended to me as doing a particularly good job of reaching out to and um, serving the Latinx community. Uh, the state 211 system has um, done an increasingly good job of making Spanish language operators available for people who have um, emergency needs. And then there are some other organizations that particularly reach out to others in the state as well. Um, and Lache Latino, uh, the Episcopal Farm Workers Network, uh, the Latin American Coalition, uh, all have uh, information specific to the COVID virus right now, but also websites that uh, have become trusted sources to many people. Um, and wanted to show uh, Juvencio the, the website and information about a Mexican as well. Uh, just so people can get a sense of how to get in contact with you. And while, while we show that, could you just talk a little bit about how you've converted your services over the past uh, couple of weeks to become a virtual organization? Well, one of the things we uh, <clears throat> decided to do uh, is to establish a, a community task force. Uh, this is with the staff and, and the organization, but also with other partners. So on, on a <clears throat> regular basis, we meet to talk about as, as we evaluate and see the situation that these communities are facing right now. We're getting ready to put uh, a, an evaluation form to see what are the needs. Uh, we're also talking to funders 
to provide some immediate assistance. Remember again, this population, mostly they're not gonna get the benefits as everybody else will. So we had to come up with a, um, a ways that we can provide at least in, in emergency assistance for those communities. So we in conversation with some funders can offer some, some, some financial support so we can offer some of these families. The families have been calling for the last couple of weeks now. So this task force is evaluating the situations. We're gonna use different tools to reach out to the population. One that has been very effective is using what we call the WhatsApp is through, a, through a, a, an iPhone that we can connect communities together um, and, and kind of evaluate the situations. We also reaching out to other organizations across the state. Here in Pitt County, they have established, a, 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 the county has established a community task force uh, through different organizations that we also link with them. So we, we don't want to overdo things. We want to collaborate and do things the more effective way. And we can help each other in terms of as we move forward. So this thing, this task force is uh, six members of, 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 of our organization that is working in the different parts from Raleigh to Eastern North Carolina is to try to evaluate. We also, we are working with some of the Latino organizations across the states and by evaluating the situation and to see what things that we found as, as we go along. Yeah, so the WhatsApp is one of your responses. The uh, You have an active Facebook presence, an active Twitter presence, and uh, latest numbers nationally at least show that 81% of the population has some sort of smartphone. And so there is, is the ability to communicate over those social media apps and the WhatsApp uh, function that you referred to. Thank you for what you're doing. We'll come back to you in just a minute. I wanted to turn to Gene Tedrow because a huge percentage of the services in North Carolina are delivered by nonprofits. Gene, could you just talk a little bit, people may not have been keeping up with the growing size of the nonprofit industry in North Carolina. Can you just give us a sense of the size of the industry and the range of topics that folks are working on? Sure. Well, there's, um, in North Carolina, there are about 120,000 nonprofits uh, across the state. In reality, about 36,000 of them are uh, reporting on their taxes on a 990. So that's the number that we would look at to use as the number of active nonprofits. And um, as you can imagine, there's nothing going on anywhere across anybody's community where a nonprofit isn't touching, whether it's a PTA um, or a Girl Scout troop or um, so some from very, very small organizations like that, community-based organizations, all the way up to um, hospitals and universities. So the tent in the nonprofit sector is, is quite wide and deep. And uh, really, we touch every aspect of everybody's life. Thank you for that. You did a survey, and it's ongoing, I think, of your members a couple of weeks ago. And uh, it showed that, uh, I guess, three weeks ago, 74% of members were already experiencing severe impact from the pandemic. 75% uh, said that there were huge budget implications. And uh, at a time when they are experiencing this kind of existential challenge to their existence, how do they pay their people? How do they do those sorts of things? They're still expected to go out and deliver critical services to people. What are you hearing from them about the ways that they are going about doing that, carrying out their mission during this really complicated time for themselves as individuals, as parts of an organization, and as people with a, a mission to serve? Absolutely. I, I have always said that the nonprofit sector is the second responder, responder in any crisis. So as and the fire folks go in on the first response. It's really the nonprofit sector whose hands are in the community every day that stay with the community to help provide support and services. And um, as you asked me to um, think about how our services being delivered differently, um, I reached out to a few of the organizations that I know well. 
Uh, one of them is uh, Passage Home in Raleigh, which is an organization, of course, that I worked in for many, many years. And the response that I received from um, Crossland, uh, who works closely with the folks who are receiving services, really talked about changing the way that they do case management, uh, minimizing home visits, um, but really using social media and technology, uh, cell phones, et cetera, to do case management, really talking more by phone, um, and then uh, trying to do virtual uh, home visits so that families who are under stress at this time are really being able to receive the services that they need. But or, it, so, so organizations are worrying about the organizational health while they're also worrying about delivering services for the people that they traditionally serve. Got it. Um, you had some specific recommendations, I think, um, that I wanted to show in a, in a slide that other organizations might be thinking about. And these are some that you sort of crowdsourced as you, as you reached out to your members and others across the state. Um, can you talk a little bit about those, what you're learning about uh, delivering services virtually? Sure, and um, these recommendations come from one of our community partners, Hands On uh, North Carolina, Hands On West North Carolina. Um, and they're suggesting that um, really looking at grassroots organizations <clears throat> excuse me, convening leaders for ideas uh, with member to member strategies and using platforms that engage neighbor to neighbor mutual support networks, uh, trying to match volunteers with needs um, on a virtual uh, platform, listening out for self organizing groups. Um, I got a really interesting example of 600 folks in a community um, organizing together to make masks to make sure that people who don't have access to them um, have that personal protection. Um, and then just really looking, at, looking closely in the nooks and crannies of our community to identify where the vulnerable tenants may be, where, uh, as um, uh, has already been said, you know, those who are undocumented and also those who are newly um, unemployed who may not really understand how to access services in a helpline. Here's an example of something that happened yesterday. Yesterday, uh, Governor Cooper announced that he was working with FEMA to make available housing for people using hotels, using possibly dormitories, using other opportunities. And so good news is that there could be as many as 16,500 places for people who might be having trouble with housing to stay, bad news is it's really hard to reach out and get that word out. How do you communicate that? What are, what are some things that you have worked on in the past or have heard about in the present that are working to help communicate to those who are unable to hear some of those messages? Well, I think generally speaking, um, there are these organizations and communities under the continuum of care. So, I'm very familiar with Way County, somewhat familiar with Greensboro Triad. Continuums of care are collaborations of housing provider and service provider agencies that understand every single day where the homeless are living um, and what the risks are. And I think that's a natural network of organizations that the governor could really look to uh, to help get the word out. And then there are um, the, and within those groups are really housing providers. One of the things that I'm concerned about with funds is um, the issue that many nonprofits will have depending on how the funds flow because um, FEMA is a cost reimbursement system. And so many organizations will not have the cash flow or operating reserves in order to provide the subsidies to the hotels if they are the ones who are making the payments. So I think we've got to do a little more thinking around how to make sure that those funds flow and are coming from those organizations uh, that know where the people are who need to be housed. Yeah, I wanted to, I know you can't single out your members without fear of leaving somebody out, but I, I did do a quick survey of some of the places that are, that are doing uh, 
a good job, according to other people, uh, in reaching out to those in their counties that uh, might be having difficulty getting information. I just wanted to show those briefly. Um, just uh, This is just a smattering of, of different places that are doing that sort of outreach. In Charlotte, uh, Q City Metro is, um, has been lifted up by some folks as, as doing a good job of uh, communicating social connectedness and civic engagement during this time. Uh, in Durham, Housing for New Hope, uh, doing particular outreach to the homeless at this time. In southeastern North Carolina, about eight counties served by Black River Health. Uh, and uh, this is citizen sourced investigative news. So some of the information that we need to know, it's hard for reporters to be in the field right now, but um, some information there that I think is interesting. We have a question from Meredith Baysmore, and, and we'll give Doug a chance at it also, but, but uh, before we leave you, Gene, uh, what are some strategies you may have heard about for reaching the elderly or those without internet? I think that is really a challenge. Um, and I think that's really where the conversations or the comments that have been made already um, regarding um, knowing people in the community. And so faith-based organizations, uh, pastors who know their congregation well, uh, oftentimes will know where the elderly are and uh, trying to figure out a platform within the congregations to identify where resources are and where the, need, where the needs are. Um, I think it's really a community-based solution um, and elder care um, agencies would, would probably help. But I think we re this is a time when um, people knowing each other in their communities, neighbor to neighbor, is really, uh, whether it's the elderly or the undocumented, we just really need to know each other in our communities. Okay. What's up? Can you just give a quick uh, plug for where you can get information about uh, nonprofit resources that are out there? You've got some uh, special page that you've set up on your website that communicates that to other people. Um, I think if you go to our website um, at uh, ncnonprofits.org, you'll have really quite a a broad and deep resource. It's relevant, it's reliable. But one thing I would like to just say is for a gap for ourselves is, um, and we, we've been talking about this um, with my staff this week, about how limited we are in making our resources available to non-English speaking folks. And so, um, Jovencio, I really would love to talk with you after this show, um, because I think if there's a way for us to uh, make available the information that we have um, either by translation services or a link to your services. Um, we have so much information and um, we're not reaching a lot of people because of the language barrier. So thank you for elevating this, Leslie. I really appreciate it. It's been on my mind all week. Great. Let's turn to, let's turn to Doug Erland. Uh, Doug, you are the former president of the North Carolina Association of Health Directors. You've been on the ground during various public health crises over a 20-year period, including during the 2010 flu pandemic. And public health has the challenge of communicating information uh, that is absolutely critical to people. And uh, one of the questions in the chat is, is how we uh, get around the misinformation that comes out during times like this. Could you speak to that? Oh, certainly. Thank you. Um, and as you said, I, I have served at the local public health level. Uh, a lot of experiences there with my colleagues. And to remind everyone, we have 100 counties in North Carolina and 84 local health departments. There is a physical presence in every one of our counties of local public health. So that to me is a, a, a nice established network by which for us to get information and to communicate in a situation like this. I think some of the principles that we look at in the communication are things that are inclusive. Uh, Juvencio mentioned about culturally appropriate, respectful language that we're going to use when we're communicating. We're not gonna blame people. Uh, it's not, it's we language, not them. Everyone deserves that chance to be healthy. Uh, we want to be inclusive and not jargony in our speech and what we're doing and want to be timely. So when you're looking at that part, you bring it down into that clear, succinct message to reinforce maybe it's three points and to help reiterate that because there's so much noise out there as it relates to communication and information. 
but if you again and my colleagues this morning have already articulated how you can utilize networks in the community whether it's a faith-based network whether it's a nonprofit, large and small, another key constituent may be some of those trusted people in the community that may or may not be necessarily a leader of a nonprofit group or even a faith-based group, but they're people that you've worked with over time as a member of that community in other situations, and you know you can trust them to help carry that message out. Uh, one of the things that, that we've done over the years is have those folks involved and engaged before something like COVID happens. You certainly learn through a situation like this who, who other leaders are, but we have such good connectivity in these communities that you can lean upon those people to help you in those different areas of a, of a county, of a city, or, or municipality. And I think that's vitally important to think about. Uh, in terms of those those groups and so you continue that network all the way out uh, i think that's an important piece as you try to get that message out and that if that person is trusted in the community then what they're telling me what they're telling my family what they're telling our neighborhood i can trust and try to block out the other it's not easy because we all know that there is so much out there right now where to turn, but there are those trusted things. I know my colleagues already have shared some of that and I have some of that information uh, for later this morning as well, as far as where people can go. But I think it's reinforcing those networks, even to the point of the social networks and people that are trusted that do have authority uh, uh, positions in the community. We've worked with Granville Vance uh, District Health Department right now with getting messages out and having some well-known local people do quick video spots about staying at home, police officers, business owners, others in the community. So even that trusted person, again, that I mentioned that may not be directly connected to a nonprofit, but is someone that is recognized as a leader in your community, it's a great opportunity to utilize them and for them to be part of that message. You build trust through that, you build relationships, and you can take this very difficult situation that we've been talking about today and that we're not through yet, but use that as a vehicle for something positive to continue to grow in the community once we are through this, this difficult situation. One of the assets that we've had in the past has been the old fashioned door knock. And now the door knock is not really out there. Have you heard any substitutes for the door knock? Sure, and again, colleagues have mentioned some of those things, but using as much as you can social media, so Facebook, Twitter, perhaps Instagram, uh, putting messages out on websites. We know though that not everyone has connectivity to the internet, but if you can reinforce this with your network and the people in the community have connections to perhaps some of the elderly population or some of the population that lives in a very rural area that has spotty internet or none at all, we can help them get the messages. We are in a social distancing and stay at home, but people are still communicating. We know that there are folks that still have to go to work. They're considered essential in our communities. We know that people have to get food and, and, and go get that or have it brought to them. So there are opportunities, even in a realm of social distancing, to continue reinforcing messages. But you have to be very, you have to be very creative with that in this situation because you can't just do the, the door knock. Uh, but by getting the information out. So even if it's in your local situation, you've got uh, grocery stores that people are going to, particularly if we think about some rural areas that, that may not have as much connectivity at times. And that is, are there things that from a, a message perspective that can be given to some of those key places that people frequent that they're still having to go to get food during this time? And again, in social distancing, but bring it home and having messages relayed when they are getting their food or when someone is picking up something for them at the pharmacy and bringing it to their home. There's all ways to do that, but I think it also gets back to all of us understanding that we're all in this together and that, and I thought Jean had a great point earlier when she talked about we're worried about the health of the community as an organization, but that organization is also concerned about its health and how it's managing in this time when we are talking about work from home and stay at home, you've got folks that work in many of these governmental entities that are having to do the same. So they're building this, this airplane in flight as we all are. So I think that's where we need to, to be patient with each other, but try to continue to reiterate those messages. So if we're being patient and being succinct and concise, then hopefully we're getting the right messages in 
and the misinformation we're keeping at bay. Talk about the role of the state division of public health. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So in North Carolina, we have a, what's called a decentralized public health system. So as I said, we have 84 local health departments. They are uh, autonomous organizations. Uh, some are connected with county government directly. Others are their own entity, perhaps multi-county jurisdictions. But they have connectivity to the North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services and the North Carolina Division of Public Health. Those folks work very closely together in terms of providing public health information, public health services. Uh, the division will work with local public health as it relates to the direct provision of services, but in even a time like now, helping provide good information to them, helping them provide support, whether it's through laboratory uh, support, epidemiology work, and so forth. There's a great relationship there that continues and having that nice direct continuity uh, is helpful to all of us out in the communities, but also knowing that you have that local health department presence in every one of our communities. Let me just turn to our full group and, and ask a couple more questions. Uh, for all of you, what do you think we've learned from the past that we've been able to bring to bear in the present? And what have we not yet brought to bear in the present that we should? I would like to jump in on that, if you don't mind. Uh, and that, that com what comes to mind is, is thinking about our work today and, and preparing for this, uh, for this show and thinking about past outbreaks and situations I've been involved with. And again, with the caveat that COVID-19 is new for all of us. It, it truly is. But many years ago, and this was prior to the world exploding as it relates to Twitter and texting and so forth, we dealt with a situation, a sad situation, unfortunately, in a more rural western North Carolina county of a case of bacterial meningitis in a high school student right before the Christmas holidays. And that we had the lab testing happening. And, and like many things, as we say in public health, it, it, you get the results or something transpires after hours once everyone's gone home, or in this case, everyone was home for Christmas break. And so we had a situation where there was an unfortunate uh, uh, death to bacterial meningitis of a high school senior. And we had to very quickly mobilize and get to all the potential contacts of that person to make sure that if they needed the antibiotic Cipro, that we could get that to them before we had, we had more illness. And we utilized, and it was a phenomenal response, and that's why I'm saying that, don't underestimate the power of social media. At that point, it was a little less social media than more of instant messaging on computers, and that was, again, more of the infancy stages. But I was just overwhelmed with what we heard talking to students as we were connecting with them. Again, people were leaving for Christmas holidays. They were going to be traveling, but the word spread through that I am component in computers, people were calling on cell phones and using, again, it was more rudimentary social media. So I use that as an example to say today we have even more access to that social media. Don't, under, don't underestimate its power. Thank you. What about public policy recommendations that we're learning right now, things that we need to fix? What do you think we need to do uh, based on what we're learning right now to improve communication going forward in the future. I'll take this from Juvencio or, uh, or Jean or Doug. One of, one of the things that I would say, um, again, uh, what we're living today with COVID-19 and the impact of seven in communities, some other states, uh, and, I, and I, I rely on some other states that have made some progress on policies. For an example, Chicago, the city of Chicago uh, signed uh, the, all the undocumented individuals in the city of Chicago can apply for financial assistance. And their funding was allocated by the city that each individual can get $1,500 to help. I know here in North Carolina, we're way behind if we can get somebody to make a proposal like that. But talking about this population, they are part of our communities. They contribute of working. They might not be undocumented, but they are undocumented. But they contribute to the economy of the state of North Carolina. 
So as a state, as a community, we are responsible to take care of them, regardless of the status. And if we can start making some progress and making some policies and change some policies that can benefit some of these communities. I mean, they are part of our communities, but we are responsible for them. Just note that um, some, some of the chat pointing out that there are things you can do through deliveries. You can uh, communicate information through deliveries. Uh, some folks concerned about folks with mental health challenges or the blind and deaf and wondering if any of you have heard any, any strategies that might be helpful in reaching out to those populations. One of the comments I heard, um, Leslie, was um, you know, the hard to reach and not so hard to reach these days. Um, an example would be uh, to look on any day if you drive by Oak City Cares, um, there's a long, long line on any given day for uh, folks who are seeking assistance. And those are the homeless, those who are homeless and also those who are housed but seeking assistance. So I think those, those central go-to places are really good opportunities for sharing information um, as quickly as possible, um, especially looking at ways in which um, not just food can be provided, but personal hygiene, um, which is something that is for all of us is a, a very important um, factor in this whole situation. Many, many people do not have access to that. Gene, as we get near the end, I wanted to make sure people, people had contact information for the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits. You've got a special site that you've set up for uh, the coronavirus response that you have, and um, there, there are two or three different places that people can get in contact with you. Could you just maybe talk, talk about your URL and how, to, how people can reach you? Sure. Do you have that on a slide or should I just say it out loud? I think I, I think we do. We've been having a little trouble with the slides. Okay. Uh, well, let me say it. Can, if I may just say a couple of things about that. First of all, it's very easy. Go to www.ncnonprofits.org and there is a COVID-19 landing page and everything that we have done um, provided for the public is available to members and non-members alike for everything related to COVID. The other thing I just, you asked about public policy, if I could just say that the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits has been absolutely central to the policy efforts, the advocacy efforts at the federal level, working with our national council for nonprofits and this advocacy effort has made all the difference to the nonprofits in North Carolina and across the, across the country, because many of the federal benefits and programs were originally not going to include nonprofits as small businesses. So the work of the Center for Nonprofits and the National Council for Nonprofits has really been second to none to make sure our nonprofit sector is not left out of, this, uh, of these relief packages. So there's, Doug, what, uh, yeah. Doug, what do you see coming out of, of this in terms of public policy? What, what improvements might we, might we be able to turn to um, as, as we look at ways that we might be able to improve communication going forward? Sure, I, I think uh, a couple of things. Uh, I will say first and foremost that we're in a, in a time with, with so many people talking about public health. Uh, more so than any time in, in my career, actually, the words public health being used consistently and continuously. That said, unfortunately, uh, at, a, at a federal, state levels, local levels, our public health workforce across the United States has been, been really decimated in terms of cuts. Many local health departments across the country have never recovered from the recession 2008, 2009, and they're, they're dealing with very difficult situations on a daily basis. And then when something like COVID, or even if it's a more regional outbreak, it stresses the system. Our infrastructure needs, needs to be built up. And that also is, it's, it's about certainly funding, but it's also about looking at workforce development for the future. We have aging workforces, as we know, across different sectors in, 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 our, in, our, uh, in our state and in our country, both nonprofit and for-profit, and public health is no different. So I think we've got to look at policies that can help with funding and can help be 
uh, addressing those needs of workforce development and trying to look at who is the next generation of that public health employee, whether that's a public health nurse, a lot has been talked about epidemiology and, and working in that realm, environmental health, health education promotion, and what have you. So those are things that I hope out of at this very difficult time, we, we see the value that public health is providing on a daily basis, and we really make policy that reflects that. I want to make sure people know how to get in touch with the Institute for Public Health, but also the Division of Public Health. So we'll show that, and then also wanted yes. to show people how to get in touch with the General Assembly. So at the top is the DHHS Division of Public Health, and they have a special coronavirus information section. Right. And that's followed by the URL for your organization, the uh, Institute for Public Health at the Gillings School at UNC Chapel Hill. Uh, yes, and there's some others. I don't know how we'll handle the other slides that we've got, but if we want to distribute those today. But uh, even landing on uh, the DHHS site, there's such a good website there for COVID-19. And then for the Institute, the North Carolina Institute for Public Health at UNC uh, Gillings School of Global Public Health, that landing site will take you to all types of different information, the CDC, uh, North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, and, and so forth. So many ways to, to get information via those, uh, those landing pages. All right, and let's, let's show real quickly the uh, way to get in touch with the House and, and subscribe to the select committee that they've set up on COVID virus. They have a number of different focus sections. One is, one is specifically focused on health, but there's also, uh, subcommittee focusing on economic support, another one on education, and another one on continuity of state operations. So if you go to that ncledge.gov site, you have the opportunity to see the uh, uh, committees. You can also subscribe and give yourself a chance to listen in on that information as they are discussing it. So Thank you to you all for being with us and having this discussion. Thanks to all of you who've contributed uh, by the conversation and the questions that you've asked in the chat room. Uh, really appreciate that. Thanks to all of our guests for being with us. Um, our guests today were uh, Juvencio Roca Peralta, who's the executive director of Amexcan, Jean Tedro, who's the president and CEO of the North Carolina Center for Nonprofits, and uh, Doug Erland, who is the director of the Institute for Public Health at the Gillings School at UNC Chapel Hill. Thanks to all of them for being with us. Um, and thanks to all of you for being with us as well. Our focus next week is going to be on food. We're gonna look at the multitude of food challenges that the coronavirus is causing. Uh, from the unexpected feeding of school children at this time of year to the unexpected feeding of newly unemployed adults, from the challenges we have getting food out of the fields to the challenges we have of diverting food from restaurants into grocery stores in a form that people can consume. It's yet another emerging issue during this crisis. If you're an individual who wants to know how you can help with this issue, an organization seeking to get food out, a person facing challenges getting food, we hope you'll join us next week for this important discussion. If you have ideas for critical public policy issues you think deserve some special attention during this time, we'd love to hear from you. Please let me know with an email. I am lnboney at ncsu.edu. And that's it for this week. We had help today from Caitlin Lancaster and Trishelle Moore, First and Future, Connecting in Crisis is produced by Greg Hedgepath. Our audio podcast comes from James Herrick. Kirsten Chang does our social media. For all of us at the Institute for Emerging Issues, I'm Leslie Boney. Thanks for being with us. See you in the future.